Hello, everyone. We're about to get started. So if you are coming to this session, you should come join us now. Um, people are filtering in. Great. All right. Hello. My name is Michael White, and this is Amir Taki. And we are doing a session on crypto for activism. I want to explain first the, the format that we're going to do. It's going to be a little bit more interactive than some of the sessions that you've had so far. So I'm going to give a 10-minute brief introduction to some ideas about activism in crypto. Then Amir and I are going to have an on-stage discussion for about 20 minutes. And then we're going to have questions from the audience. And so while we're talking, you know, think of your question and then line up at this mic and we'll, we'll just kind of go into a free-flowing discussion. Um, I also have copies of my book for free. At the end of my talk, just go grab them over there. They're in a stack. There's about 20 copies, so first come, first serve. OK. Are we ready? Great. OK, so my name is Michael White. Um, briefly, I just want to tell you my kind of story to situate myself and my context. Um, I am a lifelong activist. I started doing activism when I was 13 years old. And I did lots of things. I went to Palestine, did direct action nonviolence. I basically tried to just, every year I did a new kind of campaign. Um, eventually, I worked my way into a magazine called Adbusters, and in 2011, during the kind of uh, peak of the Arab Spring, we put out a call for something called Occupy Wall Street. And very quickly, the, the call was picked up by activists in New York City who started to self-organize, and they, they went ahead and created, basically, the movement. So I'm one of two people who came up with the original idea for Occupy Wall Street. We picked the name, the date, and that kind of stuff. And then there's about 200 people in New York City who actually organized for the very first day of the movement. Um, but I've also been kind of lurking in the crypto scene for a long time because, um, you know, Occupy, around the time that we were coming with the idea for Occupy Wall Street, Bitcoin was very new. I was paying attention to Bitcoin. I was an early kind of adopter of Bitcoin. I got my first five Bitcoin for free from the Bitcoin faucet. And so I've been in the scene for a while. I remember when Counterparty versus Ethereum, I remember the first Ethereum announcement and that kind of stuff. Um, and so it was just kind of recently they started to come out of the crypto closet, as it were, and to talk about crypto, crypto, uh, cryptocurrencies and activism. Um, and recently, when I was invited to give this talk, I actually went ahead and like, learned Solidity. So I have a basic understanding of Solidity to give more like, depth to this, this conversation. All right, so let's get into it. So one of the things that I think is a very tantalizing question is that we know that Satoshi embedded a reference to the financial crisis in, in the source code for Bitcoin. So, in, so, so one question I've been thinking about is, in some ways, is Bitcoin a better form of protest than Occupy Wall Street? Which of those things is, was a more effective response to the financial crisis, Bitcoin or Occupy Wall Street? Um, and as we kind of think about it in our minds, I want to point to some of the ways that activists can think about how to use um, blockchain for activism. So if you're an activist and you want to use blockchain, what are some of the models or ways of thinking about how to do activism on the blockchain? So this, we're going to get into that now. So there's basically four models that I want to think about. The, they are new economic logics, new funding mechanisms, new social contracts or governance, and adversarial smart contracts. So let's go through those one by one. So new economic logics. Um, I think we've seen a lot of these, right? So, so it's very easy in Solidity to create programmable money that violates core concepts of capitalist economy. So you can have, for example, deflationary tokens, extremely easy to burn a certain percentage of tokens upon transfer. You can have, like, sortition tokens, where, you know, people are rewarded randomly based on the health of the economy. So this is like Shuffle, Shuffle Monster, came out recently. Or you can have like redistributive tokens. You can have tokens that implement like a Tobin tax or a financial tax, which is something that has been talked about in the left for like 30 or 40 years, but only with, I think, the emergence of Ethereum is actually possible to encode. So there's, there's, some, there's some problems, though, with economic um, logics. The first is that activists are not writing smart contracts to a blank slate, right? Ethereum, still do, is, Ethereum is still the base currency. Um, even if you just look at like the gas cost, you still have to pay in Ethereum. So there's still, you're still, in, you're still um, basically inheriting an economic logic from Ethereum that it m itself might be unfair. Um, it's, it's hard to enact, second thing is, it's hard to enact progressive, politic, progressive policies um, that rely on knowing who is rich and who is poor, right? We know this is a problem. So obviously you can split, if you're a wealthy Ethereum holder, you can split your wallet into many different wallets to appear like many different poor people to benefit unfairly from a progressive system. And this is, a, this is the problem of identity that's very, that a lot of people are talking about how to solve. So it's very easy to appear poor in, in Ethereum 
um, and only the rich can really prove that they're rich, but anyone can like pretend to be poor. This makes a lot of the kind of um, leftist policies very difficult to implement. The third, the third problem is that the most popular economic logics have turned out to be basically Ponzi schemes, right? So this has left a lot of people in the community very jaded about the idea of creating, you know, like um, redistributive currencies. So I, I, I created a very simple redistributive currency called Sparkle, and one of the first reactions was, this is like proof of weak hands, you know what I mean? This is, this is basically a Ponzi scheme, um, which I thought was very interesting. I didn't think it was evident as a Ponzi scheme, but I, but I think that what that's saying is there's a basically a jaded, jadedness about um, new economic logics. Still, I think they're very promising. Okay, let's go on to the next one. The second area of kind of possibility is new funding mechanisms, right? So we, within the activist community, there is a uh, growing sense that we need to escape the dominance on risk-averse philanthropic organizations and foundations, right? That we need to escape the nonprofit industrial complex, if you ever heard that phrase, within activism. Um, and, and I think the, that Ethereum presents some interesting possibilities. So two examples. We have like RDAI, if you guys have been following this. So it's basically, it's like CDAI, but instead of earning the interest, you're able to um, identify a beneficiary of the interest, right? So you can deposit your, your DAI, and then you can withdraw at any time, but the beneficiary gets to keep the interest. So this is a simple example of how you could have, you could basically have people stake large amounts of, of, of money, and then interest is given to a nonprofit that they support. The other one, of course, is um, really promoted by Vitalik and others, is quadratic funding. So the point here is that basically, we can create new ways of movements funding, funding themselves on the blockchain. And so my proposal in this category would be something like, like movement coins or protest coins, coins whose, um, coins whose existence is to fund social movements. And, and um, I would love to think about that with you. Okay, moving on to the third thing, and then we'll get into our discussion. The third category is new, new social contracts, new forms of governance, okay? So activists, especially within Occupy Wall Street, you know, we talked about creating uh, a real democracy, consensus-based assemblies, and all these kinds of collective decision-making. But when we tried to enact it in the real world through our assemblies, obviously it collapsed. Like we weren't even able to make the simplest of decisions. But within Ethereum, there's been a lot of work around these decentralized autonomous organizations. We have the Yang Dao, Malik Dao, Meta Cartel, Aragon, et cetera. Um, here though, I think we've, we've started to learn that you know, just because you have a DAO, it doesn't immediately eradicate power imbalances, nor does it necessarily uh, mean a, that decision making is more equally distributed. So there's been a lot of questioning about, for example, not to pick it on any, anyone, but um, the concentration of decision making within the, the maker stability fee or something like that. This is an example of how just because it's, just because you enact a DAO doesn't mean you're necessarily creating a more democratic or, or um, liberatory form of decision making uh, distribution of power. But, but here, I think there's still tantalizing possibilities, and I'm personally really interested in the emergence of kind of sortition-based um, decision-making where people within a community are randomly picked in order to make decisions. This gets back into the problem of identity and how do you identify people, um, but there's something called Humanity DAO that's trying to verify individuals, verify humans. So I could imagine a system where you, you know, tie up with Humanity DAO in order to enact sortition-based decision-making. And then the fourth, the fourth kind of category that I want to think about um, before we get into our discussion is, is adversarial contracts. And this is, I think, is the most exciting and the most purely and essentially activist way of thinking about cryptocurrency. Um, and so I mean adversarial in two senses. First, adversarial contracts are ones that are inherently in themselves a form of protest, okay? Um, so under this category, you might think about like privacy coins. Privacy coins might be conceived of as inherently a form of protest against um, the existing status quo. Um, and the second kind of form of, ad of adversarial would be adversarial in the sense that we're learning about in, um, that we're seeing develop in like machine learning, right? So people have developed um, certain objects that like there's, a, there's a, like a, a, a 3D printed turtle that appears to a machine like it's a gun. So this is an adversarial, this is another concept of adversarial. So under this, under this, you would think about smart contracts that interact with other smart contracts or the basic Ethereum virtual machine in ways that produce political consequences, unintended political consequences. So they're adversarial in that sense. Um, I think this is the most promising direction for, for activism on the blockchain, and there's a lot of kind of thinking that needs to be done about this, and I look forward to kind of talking about it. 
But now I want to move into a discussion with Amir Taki, who um, has a lot of experience, I would say, creating adversarial concepts on the blockchain, and is himself also an activist. So thank you. Um, yeah, uh, very interesting to be with Mike, Mika here, that I was uh, also involved uh, in Occupy from very early days. Um, I think what we need to, uh, the main issue now inside of cryptocurrency is uh, we seem to be repeating the same mistakes that have uh, been shown to us throughout history, in the history of technology, and even in the history of activist movements, and we're not learning from those same mistakes. We're just repeating them over and over again. Um, as a way to segue into that, um, the point three you made about the third form of uh, how you can use the technology. You had so, new forms of social contracts, and you said the, um, in, in Occupy, they had, um, they, they wanted to create a new way, a new form of governance, uh, which in the end didn't really create any real social change. It just ended up being like a new way of managing things. And, you know, just because we create a DAO or we create some new structure doesn't eradicate the power imbalances. Um, so maybe you can talk a bit about what gave Occupy its power and why that didn't transfer to real social change and maybe some of the contemporary examples about that happening as well. Yeah. Well, this whole question about Occupy Wall Street and it's whether or not it resulted in political change, whether or not it was a failure, is um, one that's really complicated and difficult. I, I, so I, the book I, I wrote is called The End of Protest, and I was one of the kind of the first people to talk about Occupy Wall Street as a constructive failure. Not a total failure, obviously it did good things, but it, it, the movement failed to achieve what we wanted, which was like, you know, a revolutionary change in the nature of power. Um, we wanted to basically achieve what the Arab Spring had achieved, which is like overthrowing Mubarak, but we wanted to achieve that around the financial industry. We wanted to overthrow the power of money over our democracy, which we obviously failed to do. Um, I think that like, in terms of, for the crypto community, thinking about decision making and why our, our movement kind of failed, I think there's a couple things that we did wrong that I think crypto community can like learn from. First of all is that we were, we were unable to distinguish between who was in and who was not in the movement. So anyone could come up and just say like, I'm an occupier and be like a totally disruptive presence, right? This is, this is I think gets back to this question of kind of how do you, it's like identity. How do you tell whether or not someone is, is actually a beneficial part of the movement and, and is not? And right now I think within the crypto community the main way that, they've, that, that it's been addressed is this concept of like, well, whoever has the most coins, um, they are part of the community and then they get you know, 99% of the vote. <laughs> and I think that's one way, that is one way to solve it. Yeah, because the early adopters accumulated all the coins, they get to make the decisions. But that in itself is also a solution that's not giving more power. So I think it's, I think it's an unsolved problem, but I think that, that there is something about um, crypto, I believe it's a solvable problem, and I think that it, that it probably could involve some sort of, um, some of the new concepts that are being involved within the DAO. But I think that, yeah, I think that, that it is important not to be naive just because you've created something new does not mean that it's, it's inherently going to create positive social change. And in some ways, I think we can get into this, in some ways I think blockchain and cryptocurrencies are, are perhaps like the most evil technology ever created. Yeah, definitely. In, right? In some, ways they, in some ways they are the most um, unequal distribution of wealth. I mean, think about how unfair it is. Like I just told you I got five Bitcoin for free in the early days. That's, that's in, its, in itself, that is extremely unfair. Um, it's unfair to have a system where people got Ethereum for very, very, very little bit of money and now can cash out even at $190. They're making, they're making massive profits. Um, yeah, well, uh, not only that, um, there's this like a social credit, sesame credit system in China now where if you talk with the wrong person, because they're man monitoring everybody's chats on WeChat, if you're late for an appointment, um, you get like a, so a lower social score mean you cannot rent an apartment, um, you cannot get a train ticket. You know, there's, enti there's entire parts of China now where you cannot go two blocks without having your iris scanned. Entire systems for monitoring and managing human beings as tools, as, as human resources. Um, I see a lot of that rhetoric inside of blockchain going, oh, me and my friend, we, in the future we will have a smart contract between each other. These are really scary fundamental systems of control. Um, 
I actually saw a blockchain project recently, which was about uh, having people's credit scores and debt ratings on a blockchain so the credit card companies, it's like, it's like your data about your uh, score with money would become like permanent in a permanent global database. Right. Like even it's, if it's decentralized, it doesn't mean that people are free or there's no power, you know. Um, so you talked actually about um, uh, n number one, new economic models. And you said, um, yeah, you, you mentioned a few things, but the interesting point, I think, is that we should start to look at the technology, because you said, you said oh, uh, poor people, a rich person can pretend to be a poor person. Uh, we should, we should uh, start to think that these models that we create don't necessarily, um, can be quite oppressive, and instead we need to be thinking about the ideas that are driving us, and, and how we make tools for individuals to empower human beings to shape the world around them. What type of human beings we're empowering rather than a perfect system that allocate a little space of freedom and equal resources to a bunch of people? Because I think that other view is a bit totalitarian. Yeah. Uh, well, I think there's two ideas here. So one is this question of like, um, like a lot of people in the activist community kind of push back at me for even talking about crypto because they see it as an inherently um, oppressive technology. But I think instead, like if you look at the history of technology, obviously it always has like a, like a dark side. Like Paul Virilia talks about, like there's always an accident associated with technology. Um, and I think that like, I think that, that personally, I think that, that cryptocurrencies are perhaps one of the most evil technologies created. And yet at the same time, they hold this, this tremendous possibility, this whole tremendous revolutionary possibility. So at the same time as you have the ability to like, you know, like, yeah, we can live in, I, can, I think it's easy for us to imagine a world very soon where like everything about ourselves is encoded on some sort of immutable blockchain <laughs> that some government out there is like reading and it involves all of our, you know, this, this, whole, this whole level. Basically, blockchain is a tremendous tool of surveillance, yes. Um, but at the same time, I think, it, I think that, it's, that activists have, still have this window of opportunity. Like it's still so new. I mean, it's amazing to think that Ethereum's like, what, five or six years old? It's still so new that there is a possibility that we could, that we could turn things. Um, but I think like, at the same time, there's a question about how much liberatory possibility there is because of the very nature of, of the system. So, I, so it's like, I don't know, I, I don't want to just like say that it's impossible, but I also think that it is important to kind of have like a, like a, a skeptical view. Um, but yeah, it's tricky. Yeah, well, I, whenever I go to any of these speeches where people are talking about uh, synthetic derivatives so people can get easier mortgages, I'm like continually thinking like, why aren't we leveraging that to speculate on government bonds and use them to dump them in mass? Like we literally have amongst us like the pa capability and power to crash national economies. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of the thinking is on really low level. Like you have the old rich who they raise their kids from generations in, in, in particular ceremonies and, um, and rituals which are, are, are like honing their, their dynasties to maintain power. And you have this nouveau crypto rich who they just wanna buy yachts and Lambos. You know, if we want to be a power, like we want to actually be a political power, like on, step it up to a real level, we have to really think big. And the, the main issue I'm, I'm experiencing now is there are all these crypto companies and they're just focused on their brands, their little niche that they're carving out, and they're all trying to one-up each other. And it's kind of the same thing that I experienced in Occupy, I went to Occupy in the beginning. It was amazing. Uh, uh, many, loads of young people from all of the, over the country, they in, intuitively feel something is wrong, and they came there because they wanted to change something. And they arrived there, and what did Occupy offer them? They said, okay, let's have a discussion what we're actually doing. And, you know, uh, that momentum, over time, kind of dissipated. Some of them got normal jobs. Now some of them are into drugs. I don't know. But that <laughs> yeah. energy kind of just dissipated. Yeah. Well, I think, again, I think there's two things here. So one is that, and I think this is in terms of applicable to the crypto community, is one is that 
the, the, the experience of social protest teaches us that um, we mustn't be naive about the power of the status quo. The, the power of the status quo is so tremendous that, like, look at, look for, for example, look at the fallout of the Arab Spring. Like, who would have thought that overthrowing Mubarak would result in a government even more regressive than, than Mubarak? The Sisi government is worse than, and if you're an activist in Egypt, your experience in 2019 is worse than your experience in 2009. Um, so there's this, so that this relates to the crypto community. I think that in some ways when we, when we get into a new thing and we're like, yes, like we're, we're fighting against the status quo, we become very naive about the possibility of, of actually damaging that status quo. And the status quo is amazing at co-optation. So very soon um, you find that you're all of a sudden be, being absorbed. And this is, this is happening in the crypto community through succumbing to the idea that we need to submit to regulation. I see that's very much like that we should already, already be submitting to regulation um, and, and I get that because, because, you know, there's a lot of pressure to do so, but it's like it's already the death knell. I think the second thing that you're bringing up, and I think that when we think about, well, why did Occupy happen? Why do social movements happen? Is that social movements happen when you create a, a new form of protest that people suddenly believe is going to create social change, right? So one of the questions that plagues activists is this question of like, why is it that sometimes people rush into the streets and sometimes they don't? So like in the American context, like, there's been gun violence for years. Why is it suddenly that March for Our Lives emerges? Or like Occupy Wall Street, people would wonder, like in the weeks, in months before Occupy Wall Street, there was actually protests on Wall Street. There was actually a march on Wall Street that went nowhere. And then why is it that it took off with Occupy Wall Street? It's because we presented a new kind of social protest that people suddenly believed like this is gonna work. And then when they stopped believing it, it's gonna work, then they left. I think crypto is in that golden moment, or maybe it's already ending, we don't know, where people are drawn, some people are drawn to the community because they think, oh, this is a new form of, if not protest, at least um, changing the world that hasn't been tried before. But I think you're right that, that there is a, there's a window of opportunity that closes. Um, and it might be closing now where suddenly people realize, start to think, no, this isn't a space where change is possible. Instead, it's a space where we're trying to replicate um, existing models. Like, like, I love DeFi and I'm all in, you know, putting stuff into DAI and all this kind of stuff too. But um, ultimately what that's doing is replicating, in a certain sense, the existing models, which I think is what, as activists, we need to push back against and try to imagine new models. But it's very difficult to do so. Yeah, well, what is the state? The state is uh, ideology, it's uh, the military and the administration. Uh, it's a system that uses human beings as tools, as resources. And the ideology that we live under now is the ideology of liberalism, which is an ideology of nothingness. It's an ideology which is ahistorical, which is that we've reached the end of history. What I see happening inside of crypto now is 90% uh, of the projects are going to fail because they don't, they don't know, they don't have a vision of the society they're trying to create. Uh, it's all very vague and wishy-washy. And uh, something I read actually is that now um, Chinese companies are actually edging out Western companies globally because Western companies are just concerned with their own personal profit whereas Chinese companies have a core of Communist Party cadre who kind of steer all these companies towards a shared strategic objective. Now, it's the, the, the point is, is not that, um, oh, we need to create a system of management where there's a boss and the boss is telling someone to do it. No, it's not that. It's a, um, the way that humans work together is based off of storytelling. Storytelling is something fundamental from the very beginning of history, it's, it's actually, we actually understand the world better in terms of stories than we do in abstract models, you know, and mechanisms. And, and having a story or a narrative which is an explanation of how did we get here? Why is the world the way it is? You know, like, what is the world that we're trying to create? It's something that can allow many groups of people to come together to change the world. And which, if we're trying to create a world which, in, which create, which make people to be free, you know, like we need, we, if we don't, and I, and I see it a lot of the times, there's a lot of projects which is, have you, you've heard of this paper called The Tyranny of Structurelessness. Mm -hmm. The same thing happened in Occupy, you know. You go to a meeting and there's like all different sorts of people. There's like a hippie person, I don't know, a pacifist person, this guy, and they believe this thing and this thing. There's, no, there's nothing shared between those people. It's like how can you build a democracy when you don't share anything together, you know. Like you don't, 
you don't even have like a common basis on which you're, which you're beginning your work, you know? And that's why authoritarianism emerges, you know? It doesn't matter what structure you create necessarily. The technology actually, really, the way I see it is, is like a complicated artifice that we use to trick we used to trick the old power, you know, it's really an extension of ourself. And there is a constant competition between different groups with different philosophies vying for power to shape the development of that technology. It's a mistake to see technology as this like static thing that just stay there and never change. The technology is actually shaped by us, by our motives. And we have to be clear about that. Like, what is it? Where, and, and all of this news about Venezuela, Syria, Cyprus, and so on, it's fake news. Like, there really isn't any major adoption of crypto. We need to be analyzing those markets. We need to be uh, breaking them down, seeing where there's an opportunity, where, how we can deploy, develop the tools to exploit those opportunities, to, to grow, to actually make something that's useful for people. That's why the, the narrative is so important. And the philosophical level in crypto community, the intellectual level is so low, and that's why we're so effective. There's a lot of speech and focus now on structures and mechanisms, sorry, on mechanisms and techniques, but there's very little joining the dots. How do these make a structure or infrastructure, you know? We can't just think of, like, small parts. Yeah. Yeah, but, I mean, at the same time... <laughs> oh, <really? laughs> Shit, sorry. <laughs> sorry um... Yeah, I mean, I think you make a lot of good points, but I, I also think at the same time, one of the, like, one of the narratives around crypto that I think is true and is also beautiful and revolutionary is that crypto does allow, so one of the, I think one of the base reasons why Occupy failed or, or a lot of social movements run into trouble is this question of sovereignty. You know, and I think that with Occupy Wall Street, we, we basically had this kind of magical thinking that if we can set up assemblies in the streets then, and, and it's a more perfect form of democracy, then, then naturally sovereignty will flow to us and naturally our governments will have to listen to us and naturally the police won't be able to... Yep. And I think that one thing that... We, that turned out to be not true, <laughs> obviously. But there is something about crypto that, that does have an inherent kind of sovereignty. There is, a, there is for the first time, it is possible for, like you know, people in this room to come together, identify a new form of economic logic, distribute a token that embodies it, and have it, like, exist without a state having to get involved. So I think that, like, that, that is beautiful and does hold a lot of potential. But I agree with you that um, there's this whole other side, which is the, the creation of what does that look like, right? And I think it's much easier right now to... I think a lot of crypto is... is, is you know, for better or worse, it's focused around this question of, well, how do we speculate? You know what I mean? How do we create, how do we create speculative currencies that make, that make money? Which is a very different question, I think, than how do we, how do we create um, sovereignty and self-sovereignty? All these concepts that we hear about in crypto, which I think are the most powerful, but are kind of hard, so hard to actualize. In about a minute, we're going to take questions from the audience. So if you want have a question, I hope that you will line up here. We already have a question. Good. Um, and we're going to go into, into questions in about a minute, unless you want to right now, because I think questions are, are a lot more... Yeah, we can go to questions. You want to do questions? Okay, so everyone just line up and then, um, yeah, try, you know, you know, common courtesy, ask a question, not like a long speech, but Thank go you. ahead. Uh, Amir, the question is for you. About a year ago at DevCon 4, the speech was about political apathy. You mentioned uh, that people are not voting, and then the, we saw a year later the emergence of all the scandal of Cambridge Analytica. Now we of have what? lots of. Cambridge Analytica, the documentaries coming up, and uh, how they manipulated people from Facebook. Uh, the, the people that are, are the ignorance that are actually making it happen and vote. I would like you to comment uh, about what can the crypto community actually do to make a change socially? What are the first steps that you think that are gonna make a difference? Because we still need to vote, whether we like it or not, we still have to go to our governments and decide who's gonna be like in power. So if you could comment on, first of all, the political apathy, and then what can we actually, in your mind or your mindset from, from all the discussions you've been having, what can we actually do to help to make a change? Uh, well. All of the modern concepts of the computer, like the network socket, the file, were all invented in the 70s with the development of Unix. Uh, computers have not changed in over 50 years. Uh, the, compu the computer devices that we use, they've got faster, they've got smaller, but they haven't changed. And fundamentally, uh, the technology that we're using is built for consumers, for individuals. 
You know, like even something basic like sharing a file is still really difficult. You know, the whole point of civilization is bringing humans together to be able to collaborate on a large scale. So we need to think about the technology, like how do we build technology? How do we build a new paradigm of computing that can be used to support like a new type of society, a new type of civilization? Every revolutionary movement, its success is dependent on its ability to shape the development of technology. Actually, we're here in Japan now, there's two provinces, Koba and Iga, which is where the ninja originated from. The, these provinces were democratic, self-governing pro provinces within feudal Japan, and they fought a war against the samurai. The ninjas were people that they were able to uh, develop technology from common everyday items that they could use to wage a guerrilla insurgent war against the samurai who were the defenders of privilege and power. So we're in Japan, which is the, which is the, which have a very nice legacy about how technology was used to, and, and we're going into a very scary world. Like we can't be ignorant about technology, like the way technology is being used. How can we beat Facebook? Where majority? <laughs> I, I think of okay. I think Facebook is is irrelevant. Like Facebook is 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 not an, an empowering tool. But the problem is is that uh, Linux, free software. All of these movements, they're just trying to copy the dominant paradigm. They're not developing their own system of thought. They're becoming trapped in the system that they're trying to fight against. Same thing with crypto, recreating the same system inside of us. We need to create a new system, and we need to recruit the people into that new system. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, I think that's excellent. I would just add to that, though, that, that one of the things that's so difficult, and one of the things we learned from social movement creation is that the ideas that are the most powerful and revolutionary are, the, are, are not seen and it's very hard to see them so like when i when i when we came up with the idea for occupy wall street and when i told people the idea for occupy wall street before it started no one believed me no one told me it was a good idea similarly with with ethereum like like we know from the we know that like the the ideas that are the most revolutionary are not seen so it, it's also it's it's not just coming up with the new ideas it's also having the capacity to um to know that we can't tell what they are necessarily and to go against our kind of knee-jerk um thoughts about what they what they should be so next question um so you know i think it's definitely clear that blockchain technology is super empowering and that it gives us a lot more power from inside our homes in front of our laptops than we had before um, but one of the th ways that it really restricts our ability to use you know the technology to do whatever social change we want is that it has network effects and therefore we have to kind of do it along with other people who may have very different political agendas than we do even you know, inside, inside the Ethereum community, we're much less politically united, for example, than inside the Bitcoin community. And I think that, uh, but you know, imagine if you're some, a community outside of cryptocurrency and you want to you know, create, use the technology, you have to have a certain amount of like, network effect. Uh, but right now, um, people who are outside the crypto community, because the crypto was launched and basically um, seeded by uh, radical, revolutionary cypherpunks and libertarians see, you know, see the technology itself as being, you know, associated with that politics, and therefore they're not even trying to, they're not even trying to form network effects around, you know, another instance of the protocol that is used for their political goals. And so right now, you know, there's basically no major uh, left-leaning cryptocurrency. It just doesn't exist, and no major left-leaning movement is interested at all in starting a cryptocurrency. Even though, you know, just from a tech point of view, it doesn't seem obvious why it wouldn't be helpful. Um, so what do you think, you know, we could do to help people with different political views use this blockchain and, and not have the blockchain revolution be relegated to, you know, radical right-wing politics? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think in some ways, like, the, the, the sad answer is that, you know, activist culture is broken. Right? And so like activist culture has certain um, assumptions about what should and shouldn't be done. And when you go outside of those, those assumptions, you get canceled and like punished. So it's like even from within activist culture, like there's a tremendous pushback against, for example, like during Occupy and the years, it's kind of breaking down now, but there was a reluctance to engage in any, any form of electoral politics. But I think that crypto is also one of those kind of no-go zones. It's a no-go zone for activists because they, um, it violates kind of like the, the, the social concept like rules of activism. So I think one way to do, you know, part of this talk is to like break that down. Like more activists need to talk about crypto and like to break it down. But I think the other thing that I find so inspiring about Ethereum, Bitcoin, these kind of things is that 
you know, when you build a social movement, you do need a lot of people. You need network effects. Like when you're creating like the internet, you need people to use your services. One thing I like about crypto is that you don't have to wait for anybody, right? Like if you go onto Compound Finance and you look at how many people are actually borrowing on Compound Finance, like it's like 600 people. <laughs> it's a very small. It's very small. Because it, because it can, so what I'm trying to say is that there's something about crypto because of its connection to being a money in itself that it doesn't need to wait for lots of people. So I guess I would push back against this idea that we need to get mass adoption in order to have a revolutionary effect. And I would st instead say that, that the, the challenge is to, to create that revolutionary and activist -y use of Ethereum and then like just move forward and not wait for anybody. Um, and right now I think that's what's lacking. So it's like that part that's lacking rather than adoption. But I don't know if that kind of jives with your feelings about it or. I, I totally agree with you, uh, activist or left-wing politics is reach a dead end. Like we need to redevelop our thoughts and go beyond all this left-right paradigm. Yeah. If I'm trying to do as much social good as I can. Sorry, can you talk louder? Louder? Yeah. If I'm trying to do as much social good as I can over the course of my lifetime, two strategies that come to mind are uh, Bill Gates style, like launch a crypto technology that isn't uh, inherently activist and accrue a bunch of wealth and then deploy it later versus spending time, most likely with fewer resources, building activist tech. How would you think about those and other alternatives? Yeah. Well, I mean, you, I think my answer would be you have to look at what happens to people who pursue the first path. And they, it's what, so Nelson Mandela says, for example, where you sit is where you stand, which means basically like when you find yourself, so, so if you find yourself in a position where you have a billion dollars, the things that you're going to support and stand for are not going to be the things that you would have supported when you had no money. And that doesn't mean that you're like a bad person or anything, but it's, it's, everything is influenced by, by your position. So I think that, that I think that adopting a philanthropic model within cryptocurrency and relying on wealthy whales to kind of fund this ideal society, but that they themselves aren't like building an activist tech is kind of the wrong way to go. I think that instead we need um, we need an act we need like activist smart contracts that are themselves the interaction with them is the is the form of protest. I think that's what is lacking. I mean, um, yeah, and that's that's the direction that I want to go. I want to like I want to create the first. Um, smart contract that's banned for purely political reasons. And I think it's like, if you think about that, well, what would that look like? You know, what would that be? Like, that's a whole, whole avenue of thought, you know? So the, the contract itself is protest, not, oh, I'm going to, like, you know, invent, uh, you know, a new form of die and then get rich and then fund activists. Well, thank you for that answer. That really has my head spinning. Um, but... My original question was, to your point um, about stories versus systems and how people find storytelling much more natural, um, what ways have you come across to tell stories that help people engage with the complexity of systems without getting overwhelmed? Um, there's two books I want people to read. One is uh, Manifesto for a Democratic Civilization by Abdullah Ocalan. He wrote a series of five books. Only two have been translated to English. This is the foundation of our philosophy for our organization. And the second book is um, The Myth of the Machine by Lewis Mumford, who is a philosopher of, and historian of science and technology. And he connect that political philosophy to the technology. And so these books form the foundation or base of a, of a, of a movement, of a technology movement that can, um, that can make a revolutionary change in our system. But we have to we have to bring it to the contemporary uh, uh, point with like contemporary knowledge and examples. And we also have to start to build a roadmap and start to think about the technologies that we want to build, like what kind of platforms, how are we going to reinvent the operating system, what infrastructure and hardware that we need to create that we can deploy these technologies uh, in, in places when opportunities present themselves. And uh, we need to for start forming groups around these uh, philosophies. Yeah. And I would just add briefly to that, and then we're going to be shortly out of time. But um, I think that, generally speaking, a social movement is created out of three things. You need a, um, a new tactic that like, people believe will create change. You need a contagious kind of mood. And then you need something that's outside of any of our control, which is the right historical moment. Mm -hmm. right? So I think that. Um, Cryptocurrencies and smart contracts, they can be that new tactic. 
And I think that they can also be a vector for spreading that kind of mood in a certain sense. But there's also this whole question of the right historical moment. So what I like about, well, what I like about smart contracts is that they exist and they just kind of wait. You know what I mean? They're on the blockchain and they wait. So I can imagine the deployment of an activist smart contract that no one like pays attention to, but then all of a sudden something happens in the world and this smart contract becomes the foundation for this whole eruption of, of a social protest. So I guess what I'm trying to say is like there's also this whole element of things that are outside of our control that we need to like um, tune into. So we, we just ran out of time. Yep. Thank you so much. Uh, the two books, write this down, is Manifesto for a Democratic Civilization by Abdullah Ocalan and The Myth of the Machine by Lewis Mumford. These, this, this book by Ocalan is the best book that I ever read. It, it's, you can't read it like a storybook. You have to study the text. It talk about the different historical events and authors. Um, anyway, yeah. I just wanted to end with that. Yeah, thank and you. there's free copies of my book over there. So thank you very much.